and welcome to another in the ARM What Is program series. In each episode, we dive into a tech topic to give you insight and perspective into some of today's hottest design trends. I'm Brian Fuller, Editor-in-Chief at ARM, and today we're going to find out what is the CPU architecture. And to help us with that, I want to introduce Richard Grissenthwaite, who is Senior Vice President, Chief Architect, and Fellow with ARM. When he's not helping us understand what is a CPU architecture, he enjoys skiing in the winter and spending time hiking in the mountains in the summer. So let's dive right in. So Richard, what exactly is a CPU architecture? That's a great question, actually, because the term architecture is very overused in this industry. When in ARM we talk about a CPU architecture, we're really talking about the contract between the software and the hardware. It defines what a CPU needs to do, not how it does it. We use the term microarchitecture to describe how it does it, but the what it does um, is what a CPU architecture defines. And essentially, for a series of instructions that are presented by the software, what results can you expect from that? What are the limits of allowed behavior of caches and of the memory system and so on? So ARM is a company that has one particular CPU architecture, there are others out there. How do these architectures differ from each other? That's a really great question because it's, it's easy to sort of imagine that they will be radically different. In reality, while there are fundamental differences like CISC versus RISC, which was a huge subject of debate back in the 80s, uh, and ARM is very much a RISC architecture. Uh, in reality, the, the nature of what you can do on any particular architecture is, is really not that different. There are biases between them. ARM has a, a very rich collection of functionality which allows it to uh, operate very efficiently um, and is um, also historically was very good at uh, code density with the thumb instruction set. That's less important these days and we haven't concentrated that in 64-bit. But in reality, the different architectures have quite a lot of similarity in terms of the functionality they're able to offer. What makes an architecture successful is actually the number of people that use it. And you get this virtuous circle that as more people use your architecture, so uh, more people want to use it, it becomes more popular. And it's a self-fueling uh, prophecy. And so whereas in the early 90s, when ARM started out, there were tens of different architectures. Every com computer company had their own one. In reality, it doesn't make sense to go through the pain of developing different, your own architecture and um, your own tool chains and keeping all your software running. What you end up wanting to do is amortize that investment. And so having a widely licensed architecture that everyone can make use of, that's easy to access, that actually has been a big part of the secret of ARM success. We have a great deal of technical quality in there. We've got a lot of, of features, but actually it's the uh, business model of ARM making the architecture so widely available, many implementations by having different business models that has made ARM actually so successful in this industry and has effectively meant that a lot of other uh, organizations saw no benefit in having their own architecture. And so you've seen what used to be tens of different architectures collapse down to a very small number these days. So you, you covered my next question, which was what's unique about the ARM CPU architecture. How, how have CPU architectures evolved over the last 20 years or so, and how do you see them changing in the future? Well, they, I mean, the, obviously the big thing that we did back in, um, in 2010 is we moved to being 64-bit wide um, in terms of, of the basic uh, register organization. Prior to that, uh, people didn't need that amount of address space uh, to work with. And so back 20 years ago, we were working on a 32-bit architecture. People had a smaller amount of memory to work with. So things like code density were, were much more important. And so that we had things like the thumb instruction set back then. With the 64-bit architecture, we managed to take all the learnings we'd had from the 32-bit architecture and um, keep those, those features um, uh, keep the goodness of that without carrying some of the legacy that had been designed actually for some of the original uh, uses, such as the ACORN 
um, computers. So we've we've actually managed a tremendous trick of building popularity around our architecture while having less baggage in it than, for example, the x86 architecture has got. And that's uh, been a big advantage for us going forward. So we have mostly functionality that everybody needs. We haven't got a lot of baggage that was there from history, uh, which is really good. Uh, as we go into the future, we're always interested in the new problems that come along. What motivates us putting in new things into our architecture are the new problems that arise. So a couple of years ago, there was a new format that appeared for uh, machine learning, uh, Bfloat, and we introduced instructions to support that. We're increasingly adding features to support security because security is a huge area. Security isn't a problem you solve with just by doing one thing. You've got to so many different aspects of security you've got to work on. And one of the big areas that we, we work on continually with the architecture is adding features to make uh, compute, computation more secure. So lots in store. Well, thanks, Richard. In just a few minutes, you've illuminated a fascinating world into CPU architectures. Now, check out all our other What Is episodes here and be sure to subscribe to this channel because we'll be adding more as the year progresses. Thanks for listening. Thank you.